Hello and welcome back to the channel. Value added tax is still going on. It's an endless uh, topic. So let's well, let's say something on a rather small and interesting aspect, or perhaps interesting, or perhaps boring. I don't know. Depends on your personal situation and the exam or practical cases which you later are confronted with. So. Let's talk today about the transportation of goods and services. Um, special rules, especially for the place of supply of a service there. Well, the place of transportation services relating to a good and undertaken for an entrepreneur is nothing special. Here, German law, following the EU directives, just says the basic rule applies. The basic rule is if your customer is an entrepreneur, the place of the service will be uh, the place where the entrepreneur has established his or her or its business. So imagine <clears throat> that the customer is an entrepreneur somewhere in the EU. Then let's uh, look to the situation where a truck transports a good on the order of that entrepreneur from Germany through France to Spain and Portugal. In that case, uh, we have to driven through four different countries. However, if the customer of that forwarding agent or whoever does that transport is an entrepreneur, then the VAT will nearly always be refunded in form of input tax to that customer. And so, it does not really matter which country is not able to keep the money in the end. Um, as the money will almost always be refunded, you don't need to debate who gets that money because um, the final effect will be zero. So basically the most decisive aspect now is how can we organize things in a way that the bureaucracy is minimized. So. Let's again drive our car. And um, the tax is now given to that country where the transaction can be dealt with with the least bureaucracy. That's the country of the customer entrepreneur. And the payment is made by that customer, the reverse charge mechanism 13B. So imagine the guy who ordered that transport was an entrepreneur from Finland then the rules say the tax goes to Finland. Um, 3A2. The tax is paid by the Finnish customer. And the only thing you do additionally is that the truck driver has to declare that he made that service to the Finnish customer in his recapitulative statement. So um, naming the VAT identification number of the Finnish customer and the net amount of the transaction so that the Finnish customer doesn't forget um, to declare that transaction. Uh, in the rare case that the Finnish customer doesn't get a VAT refund, then indeed um, the money goes to the country of the customer. So where directly or indirectly, that transport service will probably contribute to consume in the one or other way. So it's probably the best solution. And now just imagine our customer is an entrepreneur, but outside the EU. In that case, um, we have again a journey from Germany to Portugal, for example. However, in this case, whatever VAT would be charged, also the customer could usually claim VAT back because he or she is an entrepreneur and um, got received these services for his enterprise. So there would be no VAT left over in the final effect. Um, and so no EU country could definitively keep that tax in the long run. They could gather it and then refund it. So again, it plays no big role which country can't keep the tax and have to has to give it back afterwards. So again, we can ask for the best solution under an administrative um, aspect. So we 
we are interested in getting the easiest solution for this case. Uh, so the general rule here, 3A2, says um, a place of service is where the customer has established his business, and that would mean outside the EU, so no taxability in no country of the EU, so no problems at all with the VAT treatment. So if our transport from Germany to Portugal here has been ordered by an entrepreneur, let's say from the USA, then the place of service from an EU perspective would be the USA, so not within the inland of any EU country. So no taxability nowhere in the EU, no tax consequences at all, case closed. And uh, that's the easiest way to deal with that. So that is why the legislator said uh, with 3A2 as a general rule, we are fine here. We don't need to modify that in any way. So, <clears throat> If the entrepreneur who ordered the transportation services is from a third country, the transportation service will automatically not be taxable nowhere in the EU, um, so no problem. If our customer was an entrepreneur from another EU country, then the tax goes to that other EU country. And usually with the 3A2 services in a cross-border consolation, they are combined with the reverse charge mechanism so that customer will also have the duty to declare and pay the tax in his or her own country so um, you will have nothing to do with the foreign country the only thing you do as a service provider is you hand in a recapitulative statement in your own home country and there you declare that you rendered a service um, to that customer in the other country so that this customer doesn't forget to declare and pay tax on that other uh, on that service received that's important for tax control for example if um, a Finnish entrepreneur uh, paid over or no better if you are a service provider and you get 100,000 as a remuneration for transportation services. And you say that your customer was a customer in Finland, the authorities naturally have the need to check if that is really true or if in reality it was not a fake and in reality your customer was somebody from the inland. So that's why you need that cross check. Um, good. Yeah, naturally, if it's an inland case, then the place of supply will be in the inland in the way that if the customer is from the inland, 3A2 leads to tax goes to the inland. And if it's then a foreign supplier, then you have reverse charge mechanism in Germany. If it's a German service provider with a German enterprise customer, then it's uh, taxable in Germany and there will be regularly um, charged a gross amount, so net amount plus VAT, because when you are a German entrepreneur and deliver services, then you are an inland entrepreneur, and then reverse charge doesn't apply usually. Good. Let's think about um, the consequences. In the rare cases where we now have a taxability in one of the EU states, and um, a tax for the service provider, then we will also have to look if there is any tax exemption. Um, and there are indeed. If the good is exported to a third country, then there is a tax exemption for goods which are exported for number three, letter A, USDG in the German tax code. It's an, a mandatory exemption in all EU states, so it's existing in the same form in all other EU states too. Uh, and so if the good which you transport ends up in a third country, and if let's say the place of the service is within the EU because the person ordering that transport is a customer from the EU, then it will nevertheless be tax free. If you transport the good to another EU country, then there will be no exemption because export is only if the good goes to a third country. Um, 
If it goes to another EU country, then the transport will be liable to tax and the entrepreneur who ordered the service, on the other hand, will be able to claim input tax for that transport of the good. So basically, no problem. And uh, there is even a case if a good comes from a third country to the inland. Um, on the order of an inland entrepreneurish customer, then it would be taxable in the inland. However, if when the importation VAT was calculated, already the transportation costs to the first destination in the inland have been included in the tax base for the importation VAT, then the transport is free of VAT. That's a rule which is meant to avoid a double taxation. However, then the transportation guy has to prove, to give proofs that the cost of the transport has been already added uh, by the customs authorities when it came, when they had to calculate the importation value for importation VAT. That might happen, does not always happen, so it depends really if you can prove it. Well, the rule, so with 3A2, usually leads to sufficiently good ex results. That is why nobody came to the idea to replace it by a special rule for transportation of goods when the customer is an enterprise. However, there is one case where sticking to that rule would lead to a very strange outcome. That's where the complete transport is done in a territory outside the EU. So transporting a good from uh, Beijing to Hong Kong or bringing uh, something from China to um, Thailand, um, that would be rather strange if you there stick to the to the normal rules, because imagine the guy who orders this is an entrepreneur from Düsseldorf. Then under 3A2, the place of service would be Düsseldorf. Now the whole journey was from China to Thailand, so throughout Asia. Nothing with the inland, nothing with EU. And uh, however, that would be where the customer has established his business, but it's complete nonsense. So for that particular constellation, a special rule had been created after a while. If a transport of a good has been completely effectuated within the third territories, then the place of service is deemed to be in the third countries because yeah, then there is no interest at all why the EU should claim any um, yeah, tax exemptions or make the case com more complicated than it needs to be. And so that is the rare case where 3A8 gives you a deviation from 3A2. Okay. Now we have until now only discussed cases where goods were transported on the order of a business customer. The second case left over is goods are transported in the order of a private customer. For example, a private <coughs> customer sends a package by mail. That's a transportation of a good on the order of a private customer. Or um, even more important for the individual case, a private person decides to move his or her residence. Um, in that case, you have 3B1. So a special rule for transportation of goods as the basic rule for the constellation. The basic rule here is the transportation of goods and services is taxed where it is effectuated. And that means the remuneration for every kilometer which was driven during the transport has to be taxed where that kilometer is located. So if you drive or transport a good uh, 100 kilometers through Germany and then 50 kilometers into Belgium, then 100 kilometers should be taxable in Germany and the last 50 within Belgium. Huh? Makes things a bit complicated. So if a private person orders a haulier to bring something from Cologne to a destination in China, uh, the only kilometers driven in Germany are taxable in Germany. The others are not. 
Uh, however, it might happen that you you transport something, you travel or you transport it through Germany, then through Poland, and then into the third territories. Then the kilometers driven in Germany would be taxable, the kilometers driven in Poland would be taxable. However, if the good finally ends up in China, then the transport is the transportation of a good which is subject to an export. And so under four, number three, both states would have to exempt the transport from VAT if proofs are given that the good is exported finally. Um, so complicated um, will things get if a transport is ordered by a private person and it, the good does not go into a third country but it only goes into another member state. Because then you don't have an export exemption, so it would be taxable. No, but then the matter gets more problematic. Imagine a realistic case. You are a private person, an employee, and now you take up a new position in Portugal, and so you intend to move and you give the order to, an haul, to a haulier to bring all your movable property, your furniture and all the rest of stuff from Germany to Portugal. So here's the truck driving. And under three bay one, that would mean German VAT for the German part of the journey, French VAT for the French part of the journey, Spanish VAT for the Spanish part, and you know Portuguese for the Portuguese. Uh, that would be highly complicated. Probably the haulier would try to hang himself to escape your order. Uh, and all that would be even more drastic because uh, there is no VAT refund because you are a private customer. So the chaos is definitive. And uh, people said some years ago already that it's too complicated for uh, real life. So we need to simplify the journey and so only for reasons of simplification, for intra-community transports of goods ordered by a non-entrepreneur, by a private person, one established a special rule, 3B3. The whole transport of a good from one EU state ending up in another EU member state is completely attributed to the member state in which the transportation of the good begins. And... Um, that simplifies things. It also makes sure that there is no distortion of competition because well, all suppliers from wherever um, must offer at the same tax level because not the location of the enterprises involved plays a role, but where the transport begins. And that means that irrespective of where your service provider comes from, they have all to pay the same VAT. So a Spanish provider would be forced to pay VAT in Germany um, when the travel begins here. A French too, and a German. Uh, and naturally, um, it's the most convenient rule to say where the transport starts because usually when you move from Germany, let's say from Dusseldorf to Lissabon, um, and then the most natural reaction or behavior is that you ask people nearby, so probably German hauliers, to start the transport to Portugal. And so in most cases, that also means that you, that the haulier can stay within his home state legislation. And that makes life easier. Uh, if a French haulier really wants to take a German um, order by a private customer, then he probably already is used to cross-border business and cross-border tax declarations. So he's not excluded from the order, but the most frequent case is then solved in the most easy way. Good. So please note, to sum up, if a transport was ordered by a private person and that transport begins and ends in different member states of the EU, that's sometimes called intra-community transport of goods, um, then the whole service is taxable only in that member state where the transportation begins, 3B3. 
that makes things easy enough. Um, because to sum up, if the route ends in a third country, then it's taxable in each country where the Horia drove, but then the whole thing is tax free in all countries. And if it's an intra community case, then it's liable to tax, however, only in one country. And one has chosen the easiest solution here. Good. Um, another thing which is still left over is transporting persons, for example, a bus travel, or you travel by aircraft, or things like that. Then the rules are different because then only and always, irrespective of who your customer is, the only rule applicable to the transport of persons is 3B1. Every kilometer of the transport has to be become taxable where the kilometer is located. So if you have a taxi driver who drives a customer, whoever that is, private person or entrepreneur, 100 kilometers from Aachen to a destination in the Netherlands, then the kilometers driven through Germany are taxable in Germany and the kilometers driven in the Netherlands have to be taxed in the Netherlands. Uh, by the way, that will be the reason why most taxi drivers will only be willing to transport you to the border and then tell you now from the border onwards, take one of my Dutch colleagues to transport you through the Netherlands. Uh, because most of them are not motivated to fill out foreign tax declarations as a taxi driver. Um, yeah, so uh, the transportation rules for persons are highly complicated in practice. So there is a need for simplification sometimes. Uh, for example, um, with regard to the taxi driver case, there is in the German implementation regulation a rule that very small parts of a cross-border route uh, can be treated as being in the inland or can be um, treated, can be ignored that they are abroad. So um, small parts, if it's a very small part of the journey, um, it will be ignored that it's a cross-border case. So a Dutch taxi driver who um, also covers some 500 meters into Germany. These will be ignored and the German who travels some 200 or 300 meters into the Netherlands, then that short part of the journey will also be ignored legally. Hmm? Okay. And uh, it's especially difficult if people travel by plane, uh, because imagine now you start in Frankfurt and then the plane crosses um, France, Spain, Portugal. Um, and, and now it's a bit difficult to have a border control or something like that in the air. Um, and it's always quick and dirty because you're 20 minutes or so, if any, uh, traveling through the French airspace. And um, that was always regarded too difficult. Um, so there is in the German law a rule that um, the taxation of travel kilometers by foreign aircraft carriers can be ignored and remains untaxed uh, for reasons of simplification if these countries do the same reciprocally with German providers crossing their airspace. Um, highly specific, so hear it and forget it if you don't work in that sector. Um, so in general, however, the EU has not yet found a convincing way to simplify the rules for the transport of persons. So uh, 3B1 is still applicable to every case, um, especially, let's say, if, if you do a bus travel through a tour through Europe with the bus, then you travel with your passengers through Germany and France and Italy, then each kilometer would have to be taxed in the country where you drove that kilometer. Uh, so for people organizing a bus travel, uh, life is hard if they do cross-border travels because they have to declare a part of the journey um, 
net remuneration in every country which they cross. So that's one of the reasons why people don't like bus travels. Yeah, um, that's a small overview over the rules for the transportation of goods and services. And that shall be sufficient for this time. Goodbye, and I hope to see you soon back on the channel for the next chapter.